Thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you folks today. I'm a UH alumni, and yeah, it's, it's been a really exciting journey. Um, I, what I want to do today is, is tell our story as a business. I just want to talk story with you. I have some points that I want to hit in general. I'm going to weave in some videos that we've created. So I hope that you leave here with you know, a real understanding of our brand, our business, our market, our niche, who we are as a company, as makers, um, what we do, but also, more importantly, why we do it. And I hope that comes across in the story. As I'm talking story with you and, and, and sharing our company history, I'll also probably interrupt myself and take some moments to reflect on some ideas, um, you know, about what it, what it is to be an entrepreneur and to be part of a family business, um, you know, just the lifestyle of an entrepreneur as I uh, share our story. So um, I do re really well with lots of questions. So if at any point you want to interrupt and ask, um, and then at the q and I'm looking forward to that. All right, yeah. sound good? Cool, all right, so how many of you guys have had our chocolate? Awesome, that's amazing. How many of you guys have visited Manoa Chocolate in Kailua? Okay, great, so that means that um, I'll, I'm bringing it to you today, you know, the, the ideas and the concepts behind it, but I encourage you all to come and visit us. Our tasting room and factory is in Kailua town. That's where my husband Dylan was born and raised. Um, he's like four generations. Uh, Hawaii boy, and I'm originally from uh, Jersey, moved here when I was 17. We actually are like high school sweethearts. We met in high school and like just kind of grew up together, became life partners um, since that point. So anyway, we're in Kailua town because we wanted to give back to our community. We, you know, when I was in college here, it was, there was a lot of talk about brain drain, losing great resources, uh, local folks who have a lot to contribute to the state and the economy, but people felt like there wasn't a lot of opportunity. And, you know, I was like, you know, from the beginning, Dylan and I were committed to building a life here, building a business here, and giving back. So, especially in our hometown, you know, Kailua is rapidly changing. Um, so, rather than like complain about it, it's a huge opportunity to start a business to be successful and, and turn it into like the vibe and the style of community that you want to see as it grows. So that's why we're in Kailua, but we're called Manoa Chocolate, which is kind of. You know, a lot of people are like, how come you guys are in Kailua and you're called Manoa, right? I get that a lot. We did it on purpose. And we did it on purpose because Olelo Hawaii. How many of you guys speak Hawaiian? Okay, so we want, we want to use the language. We live here in the state. And, you know, that's part of understanding our history and, and bringing it back. So we're using the word Manoa not for the place name, but for the meaning. And it means thick, solid, vast grand, kind of wide and deep, so it refers to our style of chocolate that we make. We make dark chocolate, even our milk chocolates are on the darker side, so manoa, it means um, you're actually tasting the cacao. We typically do 70%, so the idea that it has, you know, a start, a middle, a finish, it's complex, it's manoa, and also ho'o manoa means to thicken, so I always imagine the chocolate bars when they're starting to harden in the molds, so anyway, that's why if you're ever wondering. We're in Kailua town, though. Um, have, have you guys gone to our original factory in, in Cinnamons? Anybody visited the new space? All right, we just opened an expansion. Okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce kind of like my background. So who am I? Tamara Butterbaugh, formerly Tamara Armstrong, and I started out as like, I guess my background to understand me is my dad was actually, um, I'm from the tri-state area, right, from New Jersey, and my dad would commute every day to the city and he worked um, in Wall Street as an investment banker. So I always admired him and looked up to him. I loved um, the business side that he brought to my personality. And Wall Street's a really interesting, complex place, as you guys probably know. And he's, my dad's like the ultimate um, Eagle Scout, like super by the book and you know, very um, honorable. And so he had to navigate a lot of interesting things on Wall Street. Um, but he was really passionate about creating big projects and bringing all the investors and all of the um, partners to the table and structuring big deals that got um, projects done like paper mills or, you know, power plants or new airlines. So that was kind of interesting. But then somebody who had lots of privilege, I, um, you know, I grew up in a place that was like perfect, you know. I'm from Ridgewood, New Jersey. It's a, it's a gorgeous, like Pleasantville kind of a place. 
And I had a lot of time to think about you know, what I had access to, and I really wanted to have like, a good impact on the world. So family dinners would be like my dad um, and I arguing over like, the planet and like, how business was evil. And, and global economics were destroying the world, and what about the trees? And so kind of that's, that's where I'm coming from. And when I was in college, I was like, these two worlds, they're, meant, they're not opposing. But all of the rhetoric I was getting in college was like that corporations were evil and, and plundering the planet and destroying the earth. And I was really passionate about you know, having a positive impact on the planet. So I'm like the ultimate. Um, environmentalist, I guess, in a lot of ways, and also business person. So how do those two things come together? So when I was at UH, I decided um, that I wanted to study sustainability, which, you know, during that time, this was like 12 years ago, was a huge buzzword. Are you guys still using it a lot in college lingo? So I wanted to explore that concept, the idea that business can be good for the world. And I wanted that to be my degree. And so we didn't really have a sustainability um, program here at the time. And so I ended up going to the environmental studies program. I started out in like global environmental science. Wanted to learn about like the global environmental issues, understand the dynamics of that. And realized that I really didn't like chemistry or math at all. And I'm more of a <laughs> communicator. And I was not having you know, failure in my classes. So I ended up switching to environmental studies, where I more wanted to just be like the cheer cheerleader communicating the values and understand enough of the science to help people understand why we need to make certain changes in society. So um, Sustainable UH, you guys may have heard of that um, organization. So I was part of Sustainable Saunders and one of the founders of that organization. Basically, we were like, we got to go green. So we did things like waste audits for the campus. Um, we put like demonstration wind turbines on the buildings. And we had a lot, a lot of really cool, fun programs. We, we did um, one day we weren't, one, one year when I was in school, they weren't going to have an Earth Day. And I was like, we need to have an Earth Day. That's my favorite day, where all the local businesses um, come together. So I did a lot of that. So that's where I'm coming from. And I, and I share this because. When you start a business, you know, it's, a, it's an extension of you. It's, it's not separate. If you're an entrepreneur, it's, it's part of you. And, it, and your business needs to be a reflection of that and your values. Or you're, gonna get, you're not going to stay committed if it's not part of who you are. So that's my background. And I think part of the reason why Dylan, my husband, who's um, the founder and owner, you know, he and I share that, that, those values. Um, and what happened was I ended up turning my sustainability degree and the experience of coordinating green projects on campus into a degree, uh, into a degree and then also into a career. So Dylan and I are same age. We graduated from Kalaheo, but I kind of went like straight through college. I was like, first thing I need to do is get a full-time job, have a career, because I wanted to see how, how like a big company was run so I could learn from that and have that experience under my belt, start like making money, be independent. Um, and I got like the ultimate dream job. It was, at the time, going green, the architecture industry was really on the leading edge. Have you guys heard of leadership in energy and environmental design? So I became a lead AP and got hired by a local architecture firm to be their um, green business consultant, to start a sustainability consulting arm within their firm, which was a really huge opportunity. And they wanted to position themselves um, to, to have the skills to get those kinds of jobs that wanted lead, lead design projects, you know, that had a green focus and expertise. Um, so I did that for about four years, and then Dylan kind of took his time. He, he's like very fortunate because his dad is awesome, and his th he has two other brothers. They all love to surf together. So as he was growing up here in Hawaii, he would travel the world with his dad. His dad would take him out of school for like, several months at a time when he was like 11, 13, 16, and they'd go like to Costa Rica for two months and like skip school. They travel the world and surf. So my, that's how my husband is. He's very interested in the world. And even though he's like Hawaii boy, lived only on this rock, he has a very global mindset, because, I think because of that upbringing and an appreciation for what we have here and wanting to just like come back and make Hawaii the best. So, 
that also plays into our business, um, so, and also our story, because what ended up happening is we're the same age, but he went to UH and took like a few years. I was working in my sustainability consulting job for about four years, and um, he was starting up Manoa Chocolate. So, he, you know, here's his girlfriend, who's got it going on, like super, you know, got a career, built her career, and is like making money and like going to work, and, and he's still like, you know, graduate, he's waiting to graduate, and he's really struggling and like searching for, who, what am I gonna do? Like, who am I gonna be? How am I gonna do anything that's gonna have an impact? So he, he took his time, he traveled a lot, and he was like, we both went to Chile, we got like our degree in Spanish for a little while, and he was just really struggling. But ever since I met him, since the moment I met him, he told me, I'm gonna be a businessman. And I was like, I like that about you. <laughs> you know, that's cool. And I believe you, you know? And I was like, it's like I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have a huge impact and we're gonna be really, and I'm gonna be really successful. And I was like, yeah, I believe you. And I think that's really what it takes, is having that mentality of like, you know, you can do this. And you need that level of determination. He's just always known that about himself. And it's amazing to watch our business grow and put himself in situations where I'm like, I don't feel really comfortable about this. This is scary. Oh my God, Lynn, have you thought about this? This is this, this. But he has that, like, he's always had that assurance that things are going to be okay. We're going to do this. And it was funny having my mom reflect on it. She's like, ever since you met Dylan, you always just kind of knew that he was, he, he was going to do this. And I was like, yeah, of course, why not? And I guess to other people all around, they're like, mm, okay, have fun making chocolate that you're going to sell for $6. Nobody's going to buy that. You know, <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Anyway, so Dylan was struggling, that's my point. How, what are we gonna do? He knew he needed to start a business. And he like, looked at solar energy companies, he tried that out, he was installing solar. He was looking at green roofs at one point. Um, from his travels in Indonesia, when I, was, I mentioned he used to surf a lot, one of the years he brought a container of Balinese furniture back. Um, and that was like a really good exercise for him, actually, in learning about importing goods around the world. Um, and it was not necessarily successful. We made our money back, but it was like a really good learning process and hard. And that's part of all of this is <laughs> like, oh, this sucks. Let's get through it and make the best of it. And get, you know, but that was a good experience. Um, and what ended up happening is it was only six months prior to graduating and he still hadn't found the thing that like really lit him up and got him excited. And we would drive, I remember driving to the west side and looking at like the hillsides with all the halicoa and we would just be like, how can we create a really cool business where we rip out all the halicoa and we plant like forests right there and, and reforest Hawaii with all native plants. Um, and that's kind of the mindset where we were coming from. And um, it just so happened that one night I said, hey, let's have like a, a movie night. And one of my girlfriends says, we're going to watch Chocolat. And he's like, I don't want to watch Chocolat. It sounds lame. And then he ended up loving it. You know, Johnny Depp was great. It's an awesome film. Um, and there was some extra documentary footage at the end of the Chocolat talking about cacao and the plant. And only a few weeks earlier, he had met somebody that became a surf buddy. At, who was studying at the College of Tropical Ag. And they were just, you know, we were at a party with my sustainability friends, and um, they, they really like hit it off. They were talking about surfing, they connected, and he said, so what are you doing um, with your degree? And he said, well, I'm, um, I'm uh, cacao is my master's degree. And Dylan, well, what's cacao? We didn't know really what chocolate came from, and Dylan had no interest in chocolate at all. That was, he was, always thought it was like a cheap candy or sweet thing. And after we watched Chocolat, he took him up and went to the labs at UH. And the next day, instead of you know, waiting a few, like an hour or two for the bus and doing homework, he you know, followed his friend up. The, this buddy, his name is Daniel O'Doherty. And he helped Dan in the labs and started learning about what it was all about. So what ended up happening was um, the University of Hawaii in 2005 had started something called the, Ag, the, the Cacao Varieties Trials Project. So Dr. Skip Bittenbender, in the, in the, this is, they have a cacao lab. They were studying ava, coffee, and chocolate. And it's like, you know, things that humans use. Um, and they were focusing on this. And Dr. Skip had planted different cacao varieties from all over the world throughout the islands. And 
you know, in different microclimates to see how each variety would do well in all the various regions. And somebody needed to get a degree specializing in the results. Four years later, the trees started producing, and we needed a local expert because farmers, chocolate started bubbling up in the state, and farmers were asking questions like, well, why is this one like got all this groovy, warty? Why is this one round? Why, why is this one red? How do I know it's ripe? What do I do with it? What are my options? So we needed that kind of expertise. So Dan became that guy. He was the local expert. And his job was to go to all the different ag research plots. And we have one in Waimanala. We have one in um, like Pearl City. We have them all throughout the islands. And we also have private sector land partners that contributed to this project. So one example is Kualo Ranch. You have Dole, which is the Waialua State up on the North Shore, one of the first major cacao farms planted. So Dan would go and, and look at the results. They would analyze the trees for architecture, you know, productivity, disease resistance, yield, and flavor. So they would actually have to make chocolate in the labs on a very small scale. Um, and that's where Dylan just like realized he was a doer. He was a creator, and he just absolutely loved the idea of taking a crop that was unique to the state, that we had the unique ability to grow because of our tropical climate, and then transform it from a seed all the way to the dark chocolate bar. So at one point, he had this you know, aha moment where he was tasting some of the stuff from the Waialua area up on the North Shore where it's hot and dry, experiencing the chocolate, and just telling Dan, dude, this is so fruity. He doesn't actually talk like that, but this is just <laughs> my interpretation for the story. It, it tastes like um, cherries. Did you put cherries in there? And Dan was like, no, man, that's the terroir. That's the terroir. So that was the, that moment where it forever changed his life. And he just kept coming back to the labs, almost to the point where we joke that Dr. Skip thinks that Dylan has like a degree in, in CTAR, which is not true at all. But Dan went on to become a world-renowned cacao consultant. And we saw a gap in the market at that time. This was 2010 when he graduated and he started the business. And this was around the time when chocolate was starting to really bubble up in the state. But not a lot of people had heard about it yet. So some people had, but it was really new. Um, and we saw a gap in the sense that a lot of the early, what I call the, le the legacy farms, the early adopters, like the Waialua estate. Um, so that's, there's some projects where Dole, Mars, and Hershey's collaborated on some test plots like back in the 80s because we've always been a great place to grow cacao. But from an economic standpoint, we were never set up for success when you're competing with West Africa you know, for the commodity. It was just no way. So it kind of fizzled out over several um, you know, years. And these cacao projects got abandoned, and buffalo grass um, grew through them. So there was the Waialua Estate was one of those projects that were kind of left. Um, and then also there was a farm on the west side of the Big Island. It's the Kona region. It, it, you might have heard of the original Hawaiian chocolate factory. Pam and Bob Cooper were sort of like pioneers in the industry. They ended up buying this legacy farm and doing bean to bar chocolate there, but almost like an island unto themselves. Like nobody was talking about it as an industry. So they were kind of paving the way, but it wasn't like you come to Hawaii and you, unless you, somebody recommends going there or ha happen to be in Kona, then you go, right? So they were doing great work, but the legacy farms basically had um, people just like sharing seeds and you know, planting in smaller plots. And Dole, at that time, had proof of concept. Once they worked with um, the University of Hawaii to rehabilitate the orchard and start looking at what they had, identifying what genetics were what. Um, but then they got it as far as the fermentation and drying, which I'll get into. And then their seeds were being sent at that, at that time to um, California for processing. And so we thought, well, what about all the emerging farmers that are starting? You know, what are they going to do? Are, they're either going to be like us, how we started in the kitchen, kind of on their own. We better start a local chocolate factory so that there's the opportunity for local processing. You hear a lot about how, you know, it's hard to do business in Hawaii. It's hard to grow things. And a lot of the reasons is because we don't have the local processing, right? We don't have the processing facilities. We don't have the economy of scale. We don't have the processing. So we said, well, we're going to fix that. And it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. 
Here we want to have a new, we want to have a Hawaiian chocolate industry. There's so much potential, but there's not a lot of farmers. We're basically just at the seed stage of the idea at UH, and we, we see that there's a gap, and we want to start a local chocolate factory to support all the emerging farmers. Um, at this point, Dole now does have um, a chocolate factory, which is fantastic. It's at the cannery. So can you guys imagine if, you know, the cannery was once used to be pineapples, it switches to fine chocolate? That would be fantastic, right?